introduce our speakers. Before we introduce our speakers, a reminder to join the call doc. Um, the link is posted in the chat, and we'd appreciate it if folks uh, would enter their names, emails, and institution for us to keep track of who's joining us in the call today. Um, additional housekeeping piece is there will be a question and answer period after the presentation, uh, which we encourage folks to come off of mute and speak their questions into the mic, if at all possible. Um, this is a recorded session, so it allows us to capture that here. Great questions in the recording. Well, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Sharon Bennett and Andy Keene from Michigan State University, who are hosting a facilities-based talk today. I'm super excited about it, uh, but without further ado, I'll pass it over to Andrew and Sharon. Thank you. Uh, my name is uh, Andrew Keane. I'm an HBC architect at Michigan State University's Institute for Cyber Enabled Research. I'm presenting with Sharon Bennett, who is the Interim Director of Infrastructure and Operations for MSU IT. And today we're going to talk about our experience building and operating a new data center and some of our ongoing work to improve it. So uh, Michigan State University is a uh, R1 school. Uh, we're an AAU member. Um, we are a land-grant institution, so we try and support our researchers, our community, and our world. Um, so we are very interested in our service mission uh, and really advancing research and our communities. Um, so we were established in 1855. We had 50,000 students, uh, 700 million in research expenditures in 2021. Um, so big university. Um, our computational history dates back to the 1950s with Mystic, uh, which was an iliac style machine. Uh, and so we have uh, had an ongoing symbiotic relationship with computation um, through that to the six through the 60s and 70s and, and into the, the 80s and 90s. And in the 2000s, we started we we established the High Performance Computing Center um, to kind of serve as a central campus resource for computational research and then established the Institute for Cyber Enabled Research as a way to kind of enable the entire ecosystem around HPC. Um, so uh, there's a picture of uh, our 26 or our 1957 system uh, to now. Uh, MSU has a lot of computational science researchers. Uh, we have everything from ag econ to zoology. Um, that's a you know a funny way of saying that, but we have um, you know very large scale people to very you know um, you know. Uh, emerging fields. Uh, so um, really exciting to work with a lot of different communities to, you know, uh, blow up galaxies or do like gene folding um, or protein, sorry, protein folding. Um, so it's exciting to be able to work with a lot. We, we have a wide community of re researchers and so they have needs all over the place. Um, uh, so as a statement of the initial problem that kind of led us to where we were at today, um, you can see on the left is a pic, sorry, here on, um, on the left is a picture of our uh, 2010 era data center uh, for HVC. You'll notice it has great windows. Those are great if you're working in there, um, but uh, internal audit and everybody else starts asking questions about why you have uh, these, you know, large investments in computation, you know, with a double pane window away from, uh, you know, Angry Birds and such. Uh, we also have our, um, uh, the upper right is our um, original uh, 1950s data center that was, that became our, like our, one of our core data centers. And that's a great, it was a great building for, for Mystic, but by 2010, we did a lot of work on it, but it's still, um, you know, a, a legacy system. And we also had our administrative data center, which uh, is, Spoiler alert, you may notice right next to the river and next to the other data center. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in, in a little bit. So, all right, Sharon, do you want to? Uh, um... Sure. Um, actually, just a second here. We missed us. You jump? Did you Sorry, take out a? You... I just bumped this, bumped this up. Uh, uh, do you want me to go? Which one do you want? Sorry. Um, this one? Yeah, thank you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> That's where I was at. Um, yeah, just to give you guys a little bit of a history before we built the data center, there was a lot of collaboration that went on 
At the time, MSU housed over 78 server rooms, plus the two additional large uh, data centers across campus. The large um, data centers added costs and, and the 78 uh, server rooms added cost, complexity, risk, and we were looking for ways to reduce that. Um, at the time, MSU was um, totally unsufficiently competitive for grants in high performance computing at the time, as well as overlooked for grants because of the, our data centers. Um, that was, if you look right now at, at the top, we have, we still have the CCDC, that's a computer center data center. We kept that one. And as we move on to the next slides, well, um, not yet, um, the admin data center, the ADM DC, we actually um, had to move out of due to flood situations. And we'll talk more about that later. Um, the risk, as I talked about it just a few minutes ago, we were uh, the admin data center was at the 100 and 500 year floodplain. Um, it gave um, this by building this new data center, it gave us an opportunity to be efficient and be able to get more grants for the um, high performance computing and research side. So that by building this new data center, it allowed us to get to achieve MSU's goals moving forward. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> so, uh, sorry. Um, this one? Nope, you got design oh. specifications. Yep, sure. I think you can. Sorry, sorry, I made a mess of that. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so, we collaborated with IT and ICER and IPF, which is our um, infrastructure facility uh, group on campus to, to provide, um, to come up with the design specification decisions for the new build of a data center. And um, the input temperature was supposed to be set at 78 degrees. We started out at 78, but we had to reduce it down to 75 to be able to run high performance computing which is fine, it didn't hurt our PUE at all. Um, this data center also was um, a power that we set up to be available day one was 2.5 megawatts. And uh, racks sizes, we actually determined to buy the, the taller racks so we could put more in 48U racks, which is big enough and we're finding all the new equipment is actually, I don't know if you guys have noticed lately, a lot of the Dell equipment and uh, uh, NetApp and stuff are actually longer um, in in for racks at this point, the old racks size. So um, fitting into the new racks, the 48U racks that we purchased has been a right decision. Uh, UPS availability, we set up for five minute runtime. Today we're running, we could run up to 15 to 20 minutes because we don't have all the power, we don't, we're not using all the power. So that gives us some opportunity. Another factor was uh, water inside the white space. We decided not at first um, to put water in the white space, but um, Andy will talk a little bit later in the presentation that we're going into that direction now. Uh, we do not allow UPSs in the racks. So um, all the UPS people, uh, UPSs, and I'll talk about that a little bit later, is provided out into our mechanical yard. Um, and then if you want to hit the next page, okay. This one or the timeline? Okay, that's good, that's fine. Okay. So in September um, 2016, the MSU board trustees ap approval to proceed. Our selected um, builders were Holder Construction, and our architects were formerly um, CH2M, but now they're called Jacobs. Um, we, September, 2016, the design was completed and then MSU Data Center collaboratively designed the input for the departments across the university to accommodate the storage and high compute needs of MSU while ensuring that the ability for future growth capacity. So the data center is built at 2.5 megawatts, but we have been able to expand that data center to 5.0 mega, uh, 5 megawatts. And then if we needed to expand outward, and we'll show you in the layout that we're able to do that for the future. And construction, actually, um, construction started in 
uh, October 2016, a year later, we commissioned the data center, four months ahead of schedule. You want to turn? There you go. <laughs> um, this is a rendering um, it, a picture of our current MSU data center. Um, the structure is single floored. We looked at two floors story, two, two stories high. We looked at um, one story, we looked at raised floor, we went through all the structure, but we ended up with a single floor hardened structure with a slope roof with no roof uh, penetration. Um, it's over 25,000 square feet, the whole building is. Out of that 25,000, we have over 10,000, approximately 600 square feet of dedicated rack space for the data hall floor, um, data salt floor. The medium, um, and you could tell there's no windows in that whole entire uh, building. Um, there's minimal entry points to increase the security. The data center can withstand winds up to 185 miles an hour. The power today, like I mentioned before, is 2.5 megawatts compute load. That will mean that that meant that 1.0 uh, megawatts goes to critical, 0.5 is non-critical, and then we gave 1. Point, uh, megawatts of to high performance computing. Um, the today the power um, PUE of is running at uh, 1.3, and um, I'll mention about the generator in the uh, next few slides. So, okay. As I mentioned, here's the, a little bit of, a, I don't know if you guys can see the layout really well, but there'll be a next slide that we kind of expanded it out a little bit. The building, as I mentioned, in the, is a lights out data center. We have a knock and a monitoring area across the um, street from the data center. We have hot aisle containment. And um, actually, Andrew, you could kind of pinpoint because you've been in the data center, you know where things are at. Um, the layout is to accommodate um, also for a caging in case we want to bring in DOD or we want to, um, the hospital wants to come in. We built for that as well. Um, we have these new Kyoto uh, ventilation units, utilize energy wheel technology um, that helps us keep the PUE approximately about 1.03, which is giving us like 50% 50 per, uh, 50, uh, percent more efficiency in this data center. Uh, compute power delivered, uh, we're at 230 volts uh, to 415 volts three phase to the racks. Um, we have a, a medium voltage UPS, which we talked about that's running outside in the uh, yard, which we'll see in a later um, uh, slide. Day one, uh, backup generator for compute is in the pro was in the project scope for um, life and safety. But the good news is, and um, we are going to be putting in a new generator for the white space in May, May this coming May, 2.5 megawatts uh, diesel Cummings generator is gonna be installed. So we're excited. Now you can see the, the layout of um, the point of delivery. So deliveries, if you can see the, um, we have the um, deliveries come in right where um, Andrew's got it, yep. And that's where we, we use software packages, which I'll talk about. We tag every, every um, equipment is tagged. We know exactly where it's going in the rack so that the time that we unload it uh, and, um, look at it to make sure we got everything tagged before we go into the data hall and it's ready for staging. Then it goes down. If you, yeah, there you go. Thank, thanks, Andy. <laughs> it's just easier to do it that way. Yeah. I'm used to doing this myself, but that's good. And then we have a secure man trap that goes into the data hall. So in this data hall, we have a grid um, a, around the perimeter of the data center. We also have um, cameras throughout every row, so we know what's going on. 
Um, I'll talk about that in the security area, but um, we do have cameras throughout, which is monitored by DPS, which is our public safety and our monitoring team. We have 312 racks um, to let today. Um, the first top two rows are set with 30 kW racks. And then the in between, and then the, the last two end of at the end of row is set for ICER, which they have 30 K racks as well. Um, we run the status center again at 75. Everything is powered A and B side. So we have redundancy in the data hall. Um, there's cable trays above. We'll see that in another slide as well as um, we did. The other thing I wanna bring up to your attention is we have these our cooling units are called uh, Kyoto's. And these were, um, we did a CFD model analysis to determine the placement of all these Kyoto's to be able to maintain the 75 degrees in the data hall. We'll talk more about the Kyoto's down more. Uh, go ahead, Annie, thank you. This is the, um, here's some, a picture of the secure white space. We use hot aisle uh, containment and cold aisle, um, like 312 racks are housed critical computing, networking and storage equipment that serves Michigan State University. Um, you can see the cable above the trays, everything's above the floor because it is a, just a one floor cement, concrete, I should say, sorry. <laughs> yeah, like that. And then there's cameras. So we know exactly all the time what's going on in the data halls. Go ahead. This is a power design. Um, I kind of, um, this is an electrical distribution system within the data center that employs uh, 2N configuration, ensuring that all data loads are served with a redundant power and supply at all times. The um, the data center serves is served by um if you want to yeah go to the very top there by the lines is the primary selective service consisting of two medium voltage circuit circuits right there at the top with um to our MSU TB Simon power plant which these lines actually made me nervous when we were putting it we encase them in underground concrete and it goes underneath the railroad tracks which made me nervous when we were doing it, but we haven't seen any issues with that. Um, it, was, it, was, circuits, uh, huh? it was the biggest, the biggest planning, like the biggest uh, amount of paperwork we had in this process was dealing with the railroad uh, team and getting that, getting them to sign off on that. Yeah, that was huge. I remember that too. So, <laughs> um, so the circuits both are critical and non-critical switch gear configurations are currently sized to provide today, eight megawatts of power. However, we're only using 2.5 today, so for medium voltage. We have a, um, the, my concern with the uh, UPS, I did not want the UPS in the data hall. So our electrical engineer and um, our um, construction company and um, IPF, the rest of the IPF that was on the actual team actually found a, a uh, medium voltage pure wave UPS that can be outside in a container that provides UPS power to the data hall. Um, it's pretty cool. The batteries are lithium batteries and I didn't want them into the data center because if fire or anything like that. So we kept them outside and it's a controlled environment and it's been five years and we've been fine. It's excellent actually to work with. Um, it's all out in the computer. You want to hit? So another part of the design, this is our AB side. Uh, we have two electrical rooms. Primary would be the green, and the B side would be the white. Everything is green and white all through the data hall. We color coded the green and white all the way to the um, actually to the rack level of the PVUs. So for troubleshooting purposes, it allows us to troubleshoot very efficiently. Um, 
we actually had this painted green and and our receptacles and everything was labeled that way as well. So it's pretty cool. The efficiency of um, of actually troubleshooting has been um, very efficient for our electricians when they have to come in. So I'm just that was kind of I had to talk them into it, but yeah, it was fine. <laughs> so go to the next slide. Okay, so. I wanted to talk a little bit about our uh, Kyoto cooling. I mean, this is a different type of cooling. It's designed to maintain uh, air supply temperature at a set point. We set point is 75 degrees. So based on, uh, this is a picture of, in the um, hot aisle containment, we have open, it's open. And so you could see the hot air plenum above goes back into the Kyoto systems, which is at the back end. And then it recirculates outside air back into the cold air aisle. Um, throughout the data center, we have Eptron controls that collect throughout the whole um, data center in different racks. And what that does is it collects values of how fast the inside air fans should run to maintain that 75 degree cooling in the, um, the Kyoto units. Yeah, the... Uh... These are indirect air side economizers, um, and you can, uh, do you want to talk about this one? Yeah, um, this one story is advanced uh, efficient air cooling technology. You can see the, um, if you want a, the, the actual wheel above, <laughs> thanks. Um, each one of these units that we have, which we have six Kyoto units, are their capacity is up to 30, 135 tons of cooling each. It recirculates the air in the space by utilizing a, a energy uh, wheel technology to reduce the requirements for the standard electric cooling. Um, usually the hot air that's brought in from the, by the time that it gets to Kyoto is usually about 106 uh, degrees Fahrenheit, hot aisle exhaust air and supplies and then it supplies the um, cold aisle um, mostly with cooling, which each of the six air conditioning units is the standard cubic foot per minute rating is about, oh, I think it was 56, 415 CFM of, of supplied air. Now, the reason why we brought these type of systems into the data center is to save money on cooling. They allow us, um, to deliver full free cooling about 91% of the year at, in Michigan. That's pretty darn good. And we, um, I haven't, I can say this, but um, we estimated around 600,000 a year because of, we brought these systems in for cooling and it's not using electrical, so. Yeah. Uh, these are, so it's, uh, these discs, the, this is a, the, the, the disc here above spins around uh, at a few times per minute. It is this incredibly dense corrugated aluminum. Uh, basically, the, the, it rotates through, pulls, the, we pull the air, uh, the hot air through that, which heats it up. Then we pull it to the outside. Uh, so uh, then we just pull the cold air through that. Um, and uh, so that avoids, we don't need to do anything besides run the wheel normal times. Yeah. It we have a set point for each Kyoto, what it needs to be set at, and that's how it determines how fast the wheel needs to go to um, push out the cold air, but it, it actually puts them hot and cold and combines it to get the airflow what it needs to be in the data hall. Um, I talked a little bit about our security. We monitor, we are monitored by public safety. We have cameras in the outside perimeter of the data hall, along with the inside, all the way from walking into the building, all the way through the data hall. Um, and, and each area, it's all secured and tightened down. Um, I'm trying to think of anything. We, uh, it's motion uh, activated videos. We keep them 60 days uh, for retention. I mean, we haven't had to go higher than that at this point. Um, we have prox cards, which we come in um, and use our cards. And we have authorizations that we go through to who's going to enter the data center, who has to be escorted throughout the data center. 
And so vendors can't just come in. I mean, they have to be escorted. Anybody that doesn't have access has to be escorted by the person that they're going with all the way till they're done doing their maintenance. Homeland Security, we had them come on site just before we commissioned the data center to make sure that we met their requirements and we passed. And so every we get audited every year, tw uh, twice a year, I actually by internal audit, uh, MSU audit, and also by an external audit, auditor. So we pass audit every, so far every year. <laughs> we haven't had any changes there yet. Um, the other uh, security, I did not bring a picture and I should have, I thought that we, if you guys are familiar, we have every rack in the data hall is, has its own individual key. It's a track of key management system. And so somebody that has access to the, so they have access to the rack. It is programmed, they use the card, slice it through a, a scanner and it, the track system opens the door and they can get their key to their rack and um, open it and then they can close it. So everything's secure in the data hall. Yep, so we have rack, it's a way of doing rack level um, or, Hard access to a rack without actually having to put a card reader on every rack and uh, yeah. um, go full. Now, this is just a high level just to tell you about um, the. it was decided not to put a FM 200 uh, gas type um, system into the, it wasn't cost efficient for the debt uh, MSU. So we put a dry pipe dual action, pre-action su su uh, suppression system into the data hall. And um, we have it set up in three zones, the data, the white space, the actual mechanical room, the electrical room, and um, there's a couple other rooms as well, just so that we actually are safe. It, it alerts first with the smoke presents itself, but then um, it detects it, pressure's lost, the sprinkler system goes off and uh, the lines are pressurized with water. Today, just to keep the lines so that we don't rust out the pipes or anything, we pressurize, they're full with nitrogen as of today. So, okay. So, as you can see here, and Andrew, you could speak on this too as well with me. This, um, we had a flood in March of 2018. And that actually um, made us, uh, it was near our data center, our admin data center, which Andrew highlighted in yellow. And um, it was, we had to unload that data center and we did it in three days. We, we um, it was unbelievable. 4,000 square, uh, square foot data center. So we had three days, we did it and we moved all the equipment, organized it and moved to the new data center with all most of all the equipment. Some of it went over to the um, other data center, which is computer center data center. A um, lot of heavy lifting. <laughs> Network design was done. Uh, we had everybody from IT, uh, whoever would help us be a part of that. It was amazing, absolutely amazing. It was the hardest work I ever did in three days of my life, I thought. <laughs> but anyway. It was very successful. Go ahead. Andy, did you have anything to add to it? Uh, no, yeah, just that I think, you know, we were originally planning uh, this to be like an, uh, the, the migration to be a, like a year long process. And we put in, uh, you know, the, the data center team and a uh, number of uh, project team and put in a ton of work planning this out. And then we just hit no on all of it. And that, so it was really impressive. I, I, I was not involved, so I can say it was, you know, it was really impressive and they did a great job um on all that and so here's some uh, andy and i thought it would be fun putting pictures in because we actually had to hire outside vendors with us but we had a group and we monitored very carefully how things were actually shut down uh packaged up ready to go on a truck and then we had a receiving group into the new data center how we hooked it up so um, there was a lot of time, very carefully thought out. Um, luckily, we had those procedures put together because we were ready to, like Andy mentioned, that we were ready to start the um, migrations actually in April. <laughs> so anyway, go ahead, Andy. Um, 
this actually, I wanted to put a little picture in there. This is our monitoring area. You can see I, nobody's sitting there right today. I mean, we do have people here, but it's just that I took a picture without people here. It was running late, so I wanted to make sure. This is our screen. We're monitoring the weather. We're monitoring the data center. You can see uh, the far bottom right uh, screen is all of the uh, data center. We're seeing what's going on. Above that, we use um, our software for monitoring is SolarWinds. We use SolarWinds today, and we monitor that very carefully for our network team and um, all the data centers. Uh, we also use DSEM, which is a data center infrastructure management system, Hyperview. Um, at, when equipment comes in, we use that to actually make sure that we have assets and they're tagged and we know exactly where or who owns that particular equipment in the data hall. Foreseer is a um, software, electrical software that we brought in to monitor to, uh, all the uh, electrical equipment in the data hall. And Siemens is also used by our IPF group for any air conditioning alerts and, and actually any other infrastructure that we have like the UPSs alerting. So the good thing is this team is 24 by seven, 365. Uh, they monitor and they, uh, if someone doesn't respond within minutes and they know the critic, the level of the, how critical the alert is or email, uh, they're getting hold of people ASAP. So um, it's, I don't think I have anything else to add to that one. Andy, did you? So, uh, I can talk a little bit about this. Uh, so we uh, on our on the HPC side, we kind of have different views of the hardware. Uh, so um, we try and in collaboration with what uh, I with ITS and IPF do uh, for monitoring the systems. We have uh, Grafana and Prometheus uh, handle our time series data. We have uh, an ELK stack for a lot uh, log data. Uh, we use XCAT for our hardware management of our clusters. We don't do non-cluster hardware management with that, but it's useful. Um, some of the tools that are built into XCAT can be really useful for doing like spot checks and things. Uh, we are currently using uh, Asinga. We have a number of checks defined in Asinga, um, but we are moving to Zabbix because of uh, Asinga's change in licensing uh, around EL9. Um, we use PagerDuty. Um, we're pretty happy with that. Uh, we have a number of different alert schedules depending on severity. If GPFS goes down, we probably want to know that know about that quickly. Uh, but you know, if less than a certain threshold does go, we don't necessarily need to wake people up in the middle of the night for that. Um, this is a dashboard one of our people put together. Uh, it has um, you know per node memory usage, CPU usage. Um, Temperature, if there's any alerts or any, uh, or if the notice are down. Uh, so at a glance, we can see, okay, system looks good. Um, we, this is a um, Grafana graph we put together. Um, this is um, uh, tracking this. So we can look uh, cluster by cluster. We have, we do it on a two year cadence. We, have, we roughly have, we have every two years we do a, we, we have historically done a cluster refresh. Uh, so we schedule them all in one single instance, but uh, we do we don't span jobs between those instances. So users have a single software environment, but they can, you know, say I want if they want a specific generation. Uh, so here um, we have, you know, this about eight percent of the systems have on, of this cluster are underloaded or below not that's not underloaded, but not loaded. Not, not very heavily loaded. We can see the total memory usage of the cluster. This is just a glance type stuff. But here we can see um, the, the current load on like a five minute uh, average uh, time and uh, also the inlet temps of there. This is particularly useful for identifying hotspots. And um, we have seen, you know, places where there are, you know, if there are um, places where we can get blow by, um, where hot air gets sucked in, um, that 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 can really cause us some issues. Uh, so we are trying to identify that. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is that GPUs um, are particularly sensitive to um, power and cooling. Uh, as Sharon mentioned, we dropped the the, the ambient temp from seventy eight to seventy five because um, 
uh, we were seeing more um, throttling thresholds. But with this dashboard, uh, I don't have any events on this right now, but we will actually be able to see when they're either in a power cap or a thermal throttle on the GPUs. Um, you can see power consumption for a couple of nodes here um, per GPU uh, and um, the per GPU temperatures, um, as well as server and temps. Um, um, Sharon, do you want to talk? Uh, sure. Uh, our data, um, maybe, yeah. Our data center engineers coordinate with our infrastructure planning and facilities on preventative maintenance continuously. We maintain up to up to date constantly. We get reports. We're, we're constantly making sure that everything is working in the data center. We do walkthroughs. Um, I have a staff of three data center engineers that run two two of the data centers today. And um, the maintenance are coordinated very well. And I, I wanna say this too is something that um, maybe at the end I should say, but um, building this whole data center, um, I think Andy's, uh, Andy and uh, I, uh, we've got uh, ICER and IT, IPF, the builders, the architects, we all worked very closely together. And it was, um, and we're still friends <laughs> after we built it. So it's good. <laughs> Go ahead, Andy. Yeah, I think that's, you know, the, uh, we are, um, you know, it's, it's, it's really been, an, I think everybody has really, you know, we, we work hard to work well together. Um, that it's, you know, we, we have, uh, we, we're trying to communicate very clearly, you know, when we have needs and, uh, you know, it's really been a, a, a productive partnership. Um, you know, installing a new cluster. Um, this is because I exported these as PDFs or as a, as a PDF. I am. You don't get to see the cool video. So give me one second. Uh, hopefully, this doesn't break everything. Um, but you know, when we install a new cluster, we have a. Um, uh, it's a collaborative project between. Uh, ITS uh, and IPF and and you know ICER and the vendor as well as delivery the delivery team um, you know they're both their uh, installed people uh, as well as uh, ultimately you can see somebody um, you know uh, get a ring of glowing lights as he uh, zips up the line um, that's not that exciting but uh, I had the video so we were, I was going to use it uh, so. Um, uh, I didn't mean to hit that button. My apologies. Uh, it is back to slides. All right. Um, so, um, yeah, moving you, forward. It, Sorry, go ahead. Just a second, though, Andy, I want to mention go back to your thing. As you can see, like I talked before, that we were green and white all the way. It's right to the PDUs. So we see the green side. It's easier. You can see when you're troubleshooting all the way, you know, you can just see the green and white where the power is. Everything's labeled and troubleshooting for the electricians and also for our, our data center engineers and for um, ICER. It, it's been helpful, very helpful. Yeah. Yeah, it really, you know, I think that's, you know, having a, we'll talk a little bit about this, but being able to standardize and uh, have, having an agreed agreed goal to work towards is, is really been helpful for us um, from a service level. Uh, so, you know, moving forward, um, you know, so today we have an air, air based system, but CPUs are already today at 350 watts per CPU and uh, GPUs are at five, like GPUs we let A100s we have on the floor today are at 500 watts uh, for the uh, NVLink models uh, and things are not getting cooler. You know, Moore's law is not slowing down. Um, and switches are getting denser. Like you can go to NVIDIA today and get a switch, a one use switch that supports 128 nodes. Uh, but the, the cables on them are absurdly short. So um, we, uh, when we first put our first, when we first our first, we, we did our first HPC system, HPCC system in 2005, one of our vendors bid a system that was, could only use 8U of RECs of RAC. Um, per uh, per rack, just in terms of their power density, uh, and it's not getting better. Like there are, um, 
there's a point where we won't be able to. So now we're talking, you know, at a thousand watts per socket potentially. You're you, we're starting to run against up against the limits of what we can move the amount of air we can move across uh, a heat sink without that is not you know huge. So you start getting so our system at our, our our data center right now is working well, but we're starting to see see limits on that. And um another I think Sharon mentioned this already, but we um we were designed this facility uh, because we have a hundred megawatt, uh, uh, effectively a hundred megawatt generator, a quarter mile away from our data center, um, but we actually, you know, that we've decided that we do actually want on-site generation. So um, we have some ongoing projects for that. Um, we had a, so we have the, uh, as Sharon mentioned, we had 1.5 megawatts on our critical side and one megawatt on our non-critical side. Our non-critical side doesn't have the UPS. And it will not have the generator, but um, the the critical side will be able to have that that run out UPS and the generator. So um, there are a number of different ways that we could add water cooling. Uh, we've in the past we have done rear door heat exchangers in, uh, in the engineering facility, um, but ultimately we have that that takes some air out of the room. But we are limited in amount of you know it's still a lot of air that you have to move through a system, uh, and it is not doesn't recover a, a, a there it still lets some air into the the, the, the facility uh or heat into the facility um so being able to do stuff like dlc where you can actually you know run water to or, or coolant to the the actual socket or the heat source um lets you move heat uh more effectively that way um alternatively you could do immersion uh, a lot of vendors are looking at this um, you know, going back to even the old clay, old craze with floor inert, um, uh, folks actually have had, I'm sure some folks in this call even have had luck with mineral oil, uh, and, uh, you know, it doesn't have to be a particularly difficult, difficult or complex solution. Uh, aesthetically, my favorite, there's a 3M fluid, um, that actually boils at the temperature that the CPU operates on, and then you condense it down in, uh, into a, uh, passive coil above the rack, but that's just pretty expensive. And uh, uh, but but it, but it looks cool. So it's it's hard for me to, to to not get excited about that. But so if you don't have chilled spiritual water in your facility, uh, you could use. There's a product. Motivator has a product called HDU, which will take a chilled water loop and exhaust it to the air. They have in rack and in row solutions. This is an in row solution and does about 100 kilowatts. Um, so that's a, a kind of a uh, it's a little bit awkward to, you know, you're, you're, you're not actually to, to dump additional heat into your room. Um, it's also kind of a little bit hacky, but it's a great interim or, you know, in-process solution. So what we're doing, um, I don't have a picture of the generator, but we're putting a, we, we plan on being able to support a generator day one. So we're putting in a generator, uh, May, hopefully, um, that's not that interesting to me on the HPC side. Um, so we have a uh, ATS and we have an external chiller set up here uh, and uh, some, uh, sorry, I guess I am on the wrong slide. Uh, my apologies. Uh, so we have cooling, as I mentioned, the cooling, the direct cool, lip cooling, liquid cooling, the immersion cooling, the, H, the Liebert HDUs, or sorry, not Liebert, Motivair. Um, and so this is the work we have in progress. The picture of the supply chain delay, I mentioned ATS because of you know what? What our what our original design criteria was. You know, we have the green and white um, uh, layouts, but when you start getting up to the sixty to one hundred kilowatt rack designs, you don't really have support for the two N power supplies. They expect that to be you know effectively in. So if you need, if your operating philosophy is that you know we need to be able to drop one of these sides for maintenance, which we have used in the past repeatedly, um, you need to have an ATS or something similar. So that's uh, we've had that in place. We have a chiller in place, and we're in the process of uh, getting that up in commission so that we'll be able to uh, pull that forward. As I mentioned, the generator, we have the support in place. Um, you know, we were, um, I think, one of the things that worked really well for us um, was that having a skilled designer who was familiar with, you know, cutting edge um, data center design stuff uh, really helped us. 
uh, think through our design choices and implement stuff in you know uh, an effective and efficient way. And um, yeah, I think uh, we've all you know get, getting buy-in from everybody on the uh, on the team really made us uh, be able to deliver this effectively. So uh, on that, I think that covers my um, uh, our prepared slides. Uh, Sharon, do you have anything more that you wanted to add before we move on to quick Q and A? Uh, no, I think we can start going to the Q and A because I see we got a lot of questions. <laughs> yep, I do, we do have a couple of videos that we can share. Um, oh yeah, uh, but yeah. let me pause. Let me pause yeah. recording since they are notionally sensitive. Um, stop sharing. Um, um, so, um, um, do we have the questions in chat or, or in the text, or should I just read off the, um, the chat? Yeah, I think the bulk of them came in at the chat, and we usually like to encourage folks to come off um, come off mute and and ask the the questions. But you know, in, to your preference entirely. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, Daniel, do you want to? Um, uh, ask questions about any, any of your questions. I could answer it. Okay. I'll just answer it. Um, it's clarify the backup power for the new DC. At the point, we have two critical um, uh, cables. I mean, uh, two critical, um, can I start? I can't even think of the name. Um, Power cables that go, not power cables, but circuits that go to the um, power plant. So that is monitored and they, they have a generator like what uh, Andrew mentioned, 100, I don't know, 100, what is it, 100 gig, a megawatt generator. We're on critical power at the data center. So if we, if the university loses power, we are still, still up and running because we're on the critical side of the university power. And so that what that means too, is we share power with uh, consumers power. So if we lose, if, if the power plant loses power, we all flip over to consumers power moving forward. So that's how the backup power is today. But once we get our new generator, it's gonna be designed to just a little bit different, but we'll be still maintaining those two critical circuits to the power plant. And our um, other data centers set up the same way, except we have roll-up roll generators that come up, but we're still on critical circuits to the power plant. Did that answer, Daniel, did that answer your question? Oh, and how much power per rack? Okay, so today I would say we have 30 kW racks and then we have 10 kW racks. Um, how much are we using? I'd have to get that count. I mean, I can't remember on top of my head, so I can yep. get back to you on that one. Yeah, 10, 10, 10 in our low density, 30 in our high density, and our water cooling, we're targeting 60 at a minimum yeah. uh, for, our, for our next ones. So um, so the 24 seven system monitoring, um, there are not on-site dedicated uh, operators. Um, we have uh, on the, on, Sharon, we don't have an uh, on-site operator, right? Yes, we do. Oh, Not, yeah, we I'm, do. I mean, I'm sorry. We're across. We are totally in a building right across the street. Oh, we have to so, walk over. <laughs> yeah. So, so, so yeah. yeah. So ITS has 24/7 operators. We're not staffed in the data center 24/7, but there is someone on campus 24/7. Yep. Um, ICER on, on the on the HPC side. Um, there is not an on-site person. We do have an emergency page rotation with an on-call um, with comp time, uh, where it's so user. So the the systems team are compensated for uh, emergencies. Um, so we didn't go for raised floors in the new data center for a couple of reasons. Uh, one, uh, being able to roll racks in and out, um, it makes it a lot simpler. Uh, it also made the you know made makes cleaning easier. It also makes dealing with you know, having power. the cabling visible is power 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 network cabling visible on top is great yeah. uh this is this is a little bit of a challenge you know I, I, when we start talking about water uh i think you know in, in a ideal you know 
blue sky world, you'd have the, the raised floor just for plumbing for, 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 for the water. So we could say the water is below, power is above, but ultimately that was not a design criteria. That, that was a choice we made when, when we were doing the initial design. Um, the, the initial design too, just so you guys know too, uh, we, we work closely with other universities that universities that built a data center like Penn State, very close with Penn State and their design and why did they go? They went raised floor, but we opted to go to the regular slab. So slab on, yeah. Okay, go ahead. So vetting access for the DC, we have um, a only a limited number of people that have access, that have card access, people that need access. Um, on my team and, and in, in ITS, the rest is escorted. Um, I don't think we do background checks on visitors, but we are they are ex escorted. Uh, anything you want to add on that, Sharon? Yeah, um, we work closely with DPS on access. I mean, we have forms that are filled out. We, we have uh, pictures of the person that's coming in so that in case if somebody forgot their badge that they'll be able to um, look at that person and make sure that's the right person going into the data hall. Um, the other things is uh, DPS is the one that approves the final and then we um, and allows them to go into the data hall. But also most people, the only people that have access to the data hall are people that have actual uh, servers in the, uh, the white space. Um, the electrical side is only by IPF has the electrical rooms, the storage rooms. It's most everybody that has stuff in the white space has um, servers in the white space has access to the storage room as well. Cause we keep like the like tools or whatever. If someone from a co-location needs help or a cable or a power cable, it's there for them to use. Um, trying to think of any, but we, we get audited every six months. So for um, access into the data hall. So we know who has access and, and we have to reach out sometimes to um, different teams to make sure that they are still the right people that actually um, need access to the data hall. So that's how it's maintained. A little manual, but um, it's online too. We use a, a software package from DPS. Okay. Uh, we were asked if we conduct tours. Uh, we do um, small groups usually, not not something we do a lot of. But uh, if there is a uh, you know a, 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 a something that meets the university's need um, mission, you know outreach or uh, specific, if if it furthers the university you know mission, uh, that's more likely to get um, approved. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, if anybody's any, if you're ever at MSU and want a tour, please reach out to me or Andy. We'll be willing to do a tour. So, yep. Um, so, we use a number of different pieces of software to monitor GPU and, and, and CPU status. Uh, we look at uh, Slurm. Uh, we also look at uh, NHC uh, through Slurm, uh, but we also um, use uh, Prometheus um, and some of the exporters out through there to provide additional information um, into our monitoring stack. Um, so uh, happy to answer any more questions about the, the data collection and, and analysis and presentation. But uh, yeah, Prometheus to Grafana is kind of the, 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 the nuts and bolts of that um, with various collectors. Um, at network network connectivity is being offered at the rack level. Um, yeah, Sharon, we do you multi mode, a uh, single mode. Um, we have switches too. Uh, the switches are at the top of the rack, and then at the end of the row, we have a network uh, um, priority network rack at the end of each row. We are looking at changing our design um, in the near future, but right now that's how we're set up. But um, cabling, uh, we have up to, I think, Andy, you guys, I, we go 40 gig uh, and 10 gig connections. Um, I don't know if you have uh, more than that. Do you, Andy? Yeah, so we do. We do. So we have, um, yeah, we have hundreds and yeah. on the, on the uh, HPC. So, so we have 
two fabric, two effective fabrics. One is run by the ITS team. Uh, that's our Ethernet fabric. That is a hundred gig core. Uh, we have a um, everything is it's it, it's active act. It's an active active pair of uh, QFX fifty two hundreds. Um, and, uh, so we spread our devices, uh, Ethernet devices across those, um, switches. Um, and those are primarily, yeah, so those are hundred, that's hundred gig core. We have 25 gig, hundred gig devices off of those. Um, on the, we also have being the HPC, we have a big InfiniBand fabric that is, um, a combination of FDR, EDR and HDR switches. Um, we have a three level that doesn't have much. It doesn't. Ha it 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 has the redundancy, and it does not have the redundancy in the way that, you know, it it there are multiple core switches, but bad things can happen to your application if one of those disappears. So it's it's more of a load balancing than a performance thing. So, um, we had a question about co cost for co-location at the um, data center. Before, we, really not, before we get into the next question, I just wanted to note um, that we are coming up. Uh, to the top of the hour, just being mindful of, of folks' uh, time. But of course, if, if you folks have capacity, uh, we certainly can, you know, continue for those that are able to stay and and uh, continue with the question. Yeah. Um, talk about cost real quick. I don't. Um, we do have costs for the data center that has been um, put together. Uh, however, we're not charging for uh, MSU uh, employees or um, departments coming in today because we're thinking that at this point in time that when you shut down a server room in uh, across campus and you bring it into our controlled environment, uh, the data center, the new data center, it's saving the university money. So yeah. we do have costs. There hasn't been pushed out yet at this point in time. <laughs> so that's a future. Yeah, as, as you mentioned initially, like 78 data centers on campus, you know, the number of horror stories I've seen of like, oh, this is irreplaceable, irreplaceable research data sitting on somebody under somebody's desk. Um, you know, that that it's really, you know, you know, that that we are that that it is in the the university has identified it as a, as a strategic goal for us to um, to move towards the data center, um, move user, researchers toward the data center. So um, I don't think we have any good or bad ATS recommendations. Uh, I think the ATS we were chosen was was provided by our IPF team. The electrical engineer is a very smart guy. Uh, we have used the APC uh, ATSs intermittently for for very small things. They're fine. Um, the approximate cost for the initial build, I don't think we're going to talk about that. Sharon, do you want to or not? It's fine. It, uh, the initial build was $46 million. Okay. Um, and that included a lot of infrastructure to, you know, that, that was not just the building. That was the power and like the, the, yep, the everything. Taking, it from, taking it from disc golf course to uh, uh, data center. So yeah. uh, what percentage of the cart... So we mentioned a new cluster every refresh every two years. Uh, what percentage of the HP cyber is renewed with H refresh? Um, so there's two pieces to that question. One is we generally try, it depends on how much cash that we can, can script together from our um, re, um, research community um, and ballpark our cluster. So our clusters have ranged in, in size from 100 to 400 nodes. Um, in terms of capacity, uh, you know, as Moore's law advances, you know, our our 128 core uh, Rome boxes look a lot better than our you know 2014 era Intel boxes in terms of just pure capacity. Um, so we tried. The other constraint there is that we are as as we run out of cap capacity on cooling, we start retiring the older systems. So um, it's hard to put a specific percentage on it, but roughly. 20%, you know, it's just got in terms of no count, no counts. Yeah. Um, all right. Um, okay. Um, any other uh, questions? Okay. 
Yeah, you guys just destroyed those questions. We really appreciate it. And that was an amazing presentation. Um, thank you both so much uh, for presenting. Uh, yes, thank you. Today. Yeah, no problem. Feel free to reach out if anyone has any questions or would like to chat about any of this. Uh, you know, I, I like the sound of my voice. Uh, so um, <laughs> feel free to, you know, I, I can go on at length about it. Awesome. Well, uh, last minute plug, if folks have ideas for future sessions, uh, please throw those in the call doc. Otherwise, uh, thank you everybody for joining us today. Thanks again to our speakers and uh, over and out.